our last presentation of the day. We have with us today Representative Lou Jones, who served a long time now in the legislature, served his sentence in the House, went over to the Senate and served eight years there, and is now back in the House again, um, serving on mainly appropriations issues, but he's been a long-term advocate of looking at the tax system in Montana and try to scale it to our new economy, and so he's going to speak to that. And then we have Representative Jim Hamilton, who, who's out of Bozeman. He's a financial advisor, but it's also served on the tax committees in the House for a couple sessions, and now also serves over on the, on the spending side also. So the two of those two are going to talk a little bit about where we're at, where we're going. They're both involved in what you've heard about the House Bill 715 study, which is a fairly large study, which uh, one or the other can explain better than I can. So without dragging on any further, we'll get to uh, Representative Jones first, and then we'll have Representative Hamilton speak. Okay, I guess I'd begin uh, um, you know, I was in uh, college, I was in uh, MSU grad school when Doug Young was there, and so uh, I guess you have another economist, to be honest. That's <laughs> I've never been an academic economist, but I have a graduate degree in economics, is what my background is, so taxes and these subjects have been something, uh, I guess I didn't go to the legislature with intent to be stuck on the spending side, but I've never been able to escape it. <laughs> and the tax discussion since I've been there. So House Bill 715, we spent a lot of time talking about uh, taxes, where, where we rank on the scales, whether they're equitable or non-equitable, but ultimately we also have to talk about the provision of the services, right? Because whether you're local government, your cities, your counties, you're, you're the state, or even the federal dollars we use, they all go down to the services. When you, when you flush your toilet, when you get your water, you're some local government somewhere better be doing their job or the water might look a little brown and your toilet might not go away. You know, uh, and so as we talk about taxes, we also have to talk about the provision of those critical services that are linked to taxes. And we certainly can talk about efficiencies, right? Can we be more efficient at providing them? But to put efficiencies in perspective, the, the cut that got made in the last special session was somewhere between three and a half to four percent. And the scream in the land was their throat was cut, that all the critical services were going to go away and there weren't going to be enough. We live in a balanced budget amendment state, right? So if you were to cut 10 percent, or I hear some people talk about cutting 10 percent in the first session, 20 percent again in the following, then you're going to have to either find a way through efficiencies to uh, um, deal with that cut or you're going to have to reduce critical services. And I guess maybe we can. Maybe there's service areas we shouldn't be involved in. Maybe there's service areas that aren't critical, but we've got to hold the discussion. Because we aren't the federal government. We don't get to just go ahead and cut income and not cut services. You know, and we obviously some efficiencies we gain, but they are not as easy as one might think to find them. And so, uh, right now, I guess we'll go through a little bit here. A lot of this stuff was touched on with that. When I find the clicker, I'll move through it fairly quickly. It is a taboo subject. It's, uh, I can tell you, it's always been the joy of my life to stand in front of rules and talk taxes. <laughs> and uh, I know that it is what it is. So taxes is a taboo subject. You know, and we're going to talk about this primarily in terms of services after we clarify a couple different items. So let's see if we can make this a little quicker work here. So first I, I wanted to clear up, and this is 2017, the number is higher now on property tax, but I wanted to clear up where the money went on taxes. I think it's important to understand, because in 17, it's, it'll be the same, it'll just be a little larger now. But effectively, uh, the, the local government lives on property tax. The state itself does not spend property tax. So let's, talk about it. K-12 schools are the biggest spender of property tax dollars, right? They're about 70% and they're done ran by elected trustees. Um, counties and, and cities uh, spend property tax dollars. Their base funding is linked to half the rate of inflation. We'll talk about that a little more. 
but they're they're controlled by elected commissioners and you have your elected aldermen the, and this is where your property tax dollars goes now everyone talks about the fact and if you look in the state farm those well the state collects 95 mills and that is correct the state does collect 95 mills it'll be about 295 million now but the trade brings the 95 mills in but a uh, sherlock decision a court case decision says we need to equalize schools it's the part of the guaranteed tax base formula and so we are exporting back to the locals more money than we're bringing in and so other than the six mills six mills that go to the university systems that just passed the vote again the state does not directly consume the property tax dollars now in truth the money they send back to the schools uh, you could call it income tax dollars right whatever you, but what i want to show is that amount of money was associated with equalization and it is being sent back out so i always make the argument is that the state does not <laughs> run on property tax state runs on income tax okay then i want to talk about i, I always hear this and this is one I, I put in here early on so we can deal with this issue cutting taxes is cutting spending and so one of my favorites is and, and again i'm not saying that we shouldn't cut a tax i'm saying we're going to be honest what we need so since i've been there i've heard about cutting the business equipment tax right we eliminate the 85 million dollars it would be better for montana to eliminate the business equipment tax i'm sure you've all heard that so let's just eliminate it in fact you said it i've heard you so here's what happens when you eliminate the business equipment tax we did not cut spending the counties aren't spending any less the cities aren't spending any less the schools aren't spending any less we did make a taxing decision so what happens there the biggest loser is going to be the residential the 85 million is still collected it's just collected from the other property classes and so when you cut one tax unless you talk about cutting the spending <laughs> cutting the services you haven't made a, a cut spending decision you've made a who pays decision <clears throat> and it's critical to understand that because if you if in a formula drive system you've got to understand it's a transference and not only is it a transference it doesn't transfer equally if you are in this example carter county it hardly hits you at all you must have no business equipment conversely if your muscle shell is going to increase your mills 140 mills in the transfer so if and i'm going to say it over and over again cutting taxes does not cut spending it changes who pays and that might be the right argument maybe eliminating the business equipment tax and having residential go up that amount is the correct thing but it is a thing and it is the conversation we have to hold ah i just said that on there transfers to the city counties the 95 mills will mean you have to come up with some more income tax dollars to send out because now the state won't get enough property tax to balance doesn't decrease spending now the state runs on income tax right there's the income tax there's the state collections for fiscal 19 right if you take a look at it 63 percent of the general fund is income tax either corporate or uh, individual which is actually llc and llp so it's not as different as it used to be very variable uh if you consider the property taxes being returned it's actually 70 percent 71 percent when you do the math the state runs on income tax the counties run on the local government runs on property tax return to the school variable uh, uh, professor young brought that up income tax is very variable corporate more so but we've also seen the variability come down into the individual income tax stream uh, with the advent of the llc's and the llp's because they are capable of, of tax adjustment you've seen it in the 2016 number where folks managed the llc's and the llp's managed the personal income stream fairly effectively you know we are one so i get that you can do that um, all right so in a variable system we have to have a rainy day fund right it's one of the reasons the state has to hold a reserve is we're variable enough that right now we have great reserves on hand followed having none in a variable system you have to keep more money in the bank so then there's the spending side and uh, so one of the elephant in the room that always has said you know our problem with taxes i've heard it if we just cut government spending 50 percent it's out of control growth of government 
that's driven our taxes. Well, if you think about it, the bottom line on this chart is CPI plus population, right? Now, I would argue the bottom line you can run government at is CPI. A tire is going to cost more. The goods for government, wages are going to go up. Is going to be CPI. And there's population more. You're educating more kids. You're going to have to pay for it. If, you, if there's three more houses and you have to plow the road, you got to pay for it. So the bottom line, CPI and population. The top line is, uh, is uh, personal income growth in the state of Montana. <laughs> And so if you look at where the state runs, and this is general fund and state special, I'll split them, up, split them up on another side, and we'll talk about what they pay for it. That's where the state runs at this time. Um, okay. Um, also to the message that uh, we'd like to point out to the number of detractors that always say that Nancy Bounce and I blew up state government. 2009 is when I started doing approps. 2015 when we were chair. I want to say the numbers don't show that. You know, this explosion in government growth. In fact, they kind of show the opposite, to be totally honest. Uh, so when politicians pander for votes by waxing eloquent about how state government has exploded, make them show you the data, because the data does not support that. So let's split the charts apart. Um, bottom line is the general fund, the yellow one. It runs right on CPI and population, right? And the reason it does primarily is that the schools, that's the school formula. 51% of all spending is school funding, and this formula is CPI plus population. Such a heavy pull that it holds the general fund spending there. The other spend is uh, the state special now, and, and we'll go through what's in the state special, but just so we think about it, their provision of services, we've got to talk about first the rate of growth and then what services supports. State special, I always call it special source, special use. We'll, we'll go through those. Uh, they're the initiatives there, your, your fish, wildlife, and parks, your other areas. Uh, you can see that for a while there, the blue line, that state special was, was growing out of control. We actually spotted that. I remember, and working on it, we spotted it actually in 09. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, Representative Cook, who's in the back of the room, carried that. What happened with state special is, is I always see it as a leak. People drill a hole in the line that flows to the general fund and create their little state special flow. It has an increaser on it and it leaks money. And after about a session, no one sees it. So it goes on and on and it leaks. And the leaks are very good about A, hiding and then having a ruthless group that defend them. And uh, so in 2011, Representative Cook raised his hand and I remember him volunteering <laughs> to carry a bill where we expired. We sunsetted every single state special revenue account there was. We had, had 21 hours of negative testimony because every advocacy group came in and wanted to kill him over it. He did have one proponent. The rest were all opponents. But what it did for us is identified the ones that, uh, that we needed to deal with. So we got it flattened. We also started adding a sunset to every special one. So it sunsets every eight years. So we did get it flattened down. It, uh, but again, uh, general fund, no surprises. Inflation state special is where it, where it runs. Uh, figured I list this top state, 10 state specials. You can kind of see what they are. Obviously, the gas tax on the roads, the, the, the school trust income is one, the oil and gas. What drove the big <coughs> increase early on was the two initiatives, right? You see them on the bottom of the screen, the, uh, the tobacco initiatives and the children's health initiatives. Because what often happens when the public does not feel you're doing the critical services they want you to provide, they carry an initiative and they tell you you have to. And so though, there's your state special spends. In this chart, critical services, what are we spending on? 91% of money collected in the state general fund is exported. 51% to education, right? Now that's K-12 and colleges. They don't live in Helena. Well, there's obviously a college in Helena and a school in Helena. But my point is it's everywhere across the state. Next big spender is Health and Human Services, nursing homes, hospitals across the state, law and justice, prisons, public safety across the state. So when you come to the state government and you say you're going to do a 30% cut, let's say we get 5% efficiencies, that means you're going to go to education and maybe eliminate 25% of the teachers. Or maybe you're going to release 25% of the prisoners. 
you know, or, you know, I guess close 25% of the nursing homes would be worse than nursing homes, right? Because they do a federal leverage. And again, my point being, you've got to talk about the services. If we are going to talk about everybody, if I ask everyone out here, do you want to cut government spending 50%, we all jump down and say, yes, I do too. But if I say identify 50% of the services you wish to eliminate in your area, right? People are really good at cutting other people's areas as fast. <laughs> but eliminate 15% of the schools in your area, suddenly that's a whole different argument. We, and, and so that's what 715 is about, is we have to look at the provision of services and can we do it? So let's look at the other providers here. And here, I wanted to put this chart up here too, another one of my favorites. Government FTE, full-time employment has grown out of control. It has exploded. It's all those extra government employees. Okay, we did take on, and I'll show you a little bit of that. We took on the district courts and we took on the Office of Public Defender, and, uh, and uh, they, they definitely added employees. There's simply no question about that. But again, beginning in, in, uh, in 09, we got it flatlined, and it actually dropped. It, since fit, uh, 15 to the uh, current time, we've dumped FTEs, 380 FTEs. Now, it comes with some interesting baggage, because like on your pension side, for every retiree, you assume somebody's being hired. When you dump your FTEs on your pension side, suddenly you have some more problems balancing your pensions. But again, is the growth of, was there this massive growth of FTEs? Now, other than those things we chose to take on, well, actually the courts made us do a, a bunch of the public defense side. And again, I just, uh, my argument in primarily talking about services is that you need to be truthful. Because when pandering for votes saying the government has exploded, it, it's just not true, right? There is a drive for taxes, but it hasn't been an explosion. Here's the two bills, right? There's your public, there's your uh, initial of your district courts and your, your office of public uh, defender that is uh, driving a whole bunch of employment at the moment. Education, our big spender, again, you can see that that has decreased in the number of FTEs. And when you put your federal chart on there, so you know, you, you see a little bump in the stimulus area where federal was above the uh, line. And you see in Medicaid expansion, the state share brought it back towards the line. But even federal spending is running between the uh, CPI population line and personal income line. So it's not growing out of control in Montana anyway. And so bottom line on this, um, you know, growth in state spending, that 91% of which goes to locals, has been reasonably close to population and inflation. Counties and city governments are going to come in a little higher than that. You know, that's part of the research we're doing on uh, um, when Amy's working with the local folks. But again, this thought process that somehow county and city government is going to run on half the rate of inflation is illogical, right? You, you think they get to not pay their employees? You know, if you take a look at, look at the cost of construction a mile of road, construction and those items grow faster than inflation. So how is it that we're going to be able to provide the roads, the water, the sewer, and not have it grow at least at inflation? And I would argue since the CPI for construction is higher than that, it doesn't make sense. So what we have forced our local governments to do is their base funding is running fairly flat, but they're forced to add special improvements, special improvement districts and fees. They've got to, in order to provide the emergency services they need, find a way to pay for it. So as we talk about these critical services we need provided, our question becomes is, can we continue to provide them under this current tax system? Federal government, same, same argument. In actuality, in, uh, the federal government, you know, Medicaid expansion gets a bit of a black eye, but the reality in the state of Montana with a 90-10 match, if you look at the BER items and the other factors there, that is not revenue positive to the state. Could there be a time when the federal government, it's not, 
It is revenue positive. Let me get that straight. <laughs> is there a uh, is there a uh, time when it may become regular revenue when the match doesn't stay there? Certainly could, and we'd have to hold that discussion then. The federal government changes what it's doing, but until then, that is not the case. Nor is it the case that those folks weren't accessing health care. They were just doing it in the emergency rooms, and they were doing it in a cost transfer to the private folks of about 8 to 12 percent is what it would have went up had we not acted. So when we hold these discussions about the provision of services, do we have tax adequacy to provide them? And what ones, you know, when, when folks come and talk to me about cutting government spending, because I too want to cut government spending, I will say, oh, okay, what services do you think we can do more efficiently? What services should we eliminate? Because we're a balanced budget state. We don't get to do what D.C. does and cut taxes while maintaining services and running a deficit. That's not how this state can work. And again, I wanted to point out one more time, since I get kicked in the teeth over these things, that under Nancy and I, there wasn't this massive increase. And you go look at the numbers. Uh, so 750, in bottom line, is it is about the provision of, of critical services. We need to know what services are being provided, by whom, at what cost, and we want to be able to model the cost of increase on those services going forward for all the areas. We want to take a look at the intersection of the tax revenue collection and see with a 10-year model forward of where we're at. You know, can we continue to provide it. We know there's been changes, and, and I'll just flash through these slides because uh, Professor Young uh, actually touched on most of this. You know, we know personal income in Montana. And, well, there's a couple things I'll add there. We know personal income in Montana is actually outgrowing the, uh, you know, we're growing faster than the rest of the U.S. as a whole. We're, we're, our, we're doing fine on the personal income side. Our problem is this chart. We're not doing it consistently across Montana. We have five counties that are basically kicking ass. So we have a multitude of economies. You have a rural economy that's running on its property tax, the rural towns out there, running on their property tax, but there's less payers. Between Amazon coming in and everything else, there's less storefronts. And so their rate of increase, instead of 100 payers, they're dropping to 95 and to 90. They're feeling a concentration impact on the rural declining. It's just a, a harsh impact on, on those folks on trying to maintain the plowing of the roads, etc. You're hearing a scream from the rurals. You have rural and growing, right? That's kind of like Hamilton. We have some retirees and folks moving in, but we have rural and growing. We have the <coughs> flatliners, kind of like Cascade County. And then you have the Bozeman which have a growth in taxable values. Our store in Bozeman, for instance, feels a far different impact than our store in Cutmate. And so, as we look at the state of Montana and we talk about it overall, we're a huge state. That overall differential is massive. So as we talk about tax equity and overall tax burden, we gotta talk about it in a way that's segmented to that area that's experiencing it, right? If your payers, if you have twice as many taxpayers, in Bozeman, they get to pay half as less. And it won't be exactly that, but you, you understand what I mean. It's, it's, it's relative to the number of people it's concentrating upon. We also have a changing economy, right? There's, we're very good. We do our best at, at, at uh, touching the traditional economy because it was around for a long time. But when you take a look at where our employment has gone, where our growth is, it's in the areas we call the services economy. You know, we're really artistic in knowing how to touch the traditional. We're not so good at touching the, the service economy. We just haven't been able to do it. As we talk about tax equity and tax fairness, you know, everybody wants the guy behind a tree to pay the taxes. But you would assume that you want to look where the puck moved and that you want to try to be fair overall. Because I, I, hell, we all shop with Amazon. We all shop with, all, utilize these folks but I'd like somebody to help me pay for the schools. I think, you know, like or dislike Walmart, it pays W-2. It pays property tax, it pays for the water, it pays for the sewer, it helps pay for the schools. 
you know, Amazon drives it on our streets, that we pay for, by the way, and, and delivers to us, but it doesn't help with the school. 25, according to Dakotas, it's somewhere around 20 to 25% penetration in commerce when they went to the Wayfair case. And so, uh, can we afford to not have them participate? I guess we can, as long as we'd like the property tax to go up at an increasing relative rate. It's a choice. Because I, I, and one thing I absolutely agree on is the idea that we're going to eliminate the property tax without having some form of consumption tax is not going to, it's illogical. You can't get the math to work, right? Now maybe, maybe we can continue to do what we do and assume it to be equitable. I don't know. Begin with the services, what do we want? So many of these charts, investment rate and income has changed in the state, right? You know, non-labor income is massively growing in Montana. Um, and I'll just touch on these. Here's what we're good at taxing, right? Our, our, uh, our uh, normal economy. Yet when you look over there, there's the big services economy. We're not very good at it. We, it, well, it didn't exist. It just didn't exist. We touch it with the income tax somewhat. Here's the rate of service of growth relative to the other set of economies. Just a fact. I like this chart. Here's your non-labor economy growth. Here's your services growth. There's your non-services, the one we're so good at. Which line is government attached to again? You know? All right. You want to look at some interesting charts? And here's service provision. Whether you like or dislike taxi or rental car, they pay, you know, they have businesses, they pay property tax, they pay W-2, uh, Uber and Lyft. And look at the time frame, from 14 to 18. You know, I spend a lot of time at nights thinking about what is my Uber or Lyft? Who's gonna come along and just destroy you in four years? Because I don't wanna be rental car and taxi today. But I tell you what, rental car and taxi did a better job of helping pay for the roads and the schools than Uber does. Now, it doesn't mean that they're wrong. It means our tax system is not very good with them. How about this? Biggest hotel, biggest to place stay in now in the country, Airbnb. Again, think of this place right here. It pays lodging tax. It's, it's almost impossible in a hotel to avoid it. You know, I can tell you that Airbnb avoids it. I stay in it occasionally. And once you stay once, you really have to go through Airbnb. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, so, again, W-2, employees, property tax. As we see the economy change and we talk about how do we ensure that we still have those critical services, that the, the, the streets still get plowed, that the, there's new tires on the snow plows, and then an ambulance shows up or a fire truck shows up, we have to talk about what services are critical and is our current revenue collection aligned to support them and to assume that they can operate below CPI and population makes no sense. Try and run your business there and tell me if it makes sense. Now, to assume, nor would it make sense to assume they can run above personal income, right? Because if you ran them really high above personal income, you would simply outgrow the state's ability to pay. You know, but the political sound bite's different than the real one. Walmart, you know, uh, uh, Walmart, state's largest employer, added 400,000 stores in 2016, had a sales decline, pays the taxes. Along comes Amazon, right? <clears throat> which, which company? You know, about a 10 year period. Nothing wrong with what Amazon do, a beautiful model. You know, the interesting part is, is that what Walmart's doing now to compete is it added an e-commerce line. But again, the physical retail plant is how we pay for our water, our sewer, our streets. I like getting Amazon goods too, but how are we going to do this today? Or we're, and if you're talking about cutting government spending, I'm gonna insist you identify what services you're willing to cut or what services you, and, and there certainly could be some, or what services that you can provide more efficiently, but that's where we gotta go with this. Uh, like this chart as well. This is relative size to the state. 
you know, shows the size of services are, shows the size of trades are, and it's, it's relative to the size of the economy in the state. Government has its 19% there in the middle. Healthcare, you know, the, the economy that uh, over there, the farm and mining and the, the, the little, the little uh, this little fella right here, the one that we all think about when we think about taxes, isn't quite as big as it used to be, is it? When we look at today's state economy, and we continue to want to have education for our children, we have to be realistic about how we're going to do it. How are we going to do it? Hopefully 715 will talk about these services, they'll talk about who does what, they'll talk about what it's going to take to maintain these services, and, and hopefully in a partnership with the tax committee, we can hold a real discussion about are we on a pathway to be able to continue to provide the services people want, the rate of growth it's going to take realistically to pay for them, and do it in a manner that's reasonably tax equitable. At least I hope we'll hold the conversation. Always show this slide, keeps the oil guys happy. But this is what's happened to our traditional economy. They're 1.7% of the jobs. They're 1.9% of the personal income. 4.1% of our GDP. And they pay 12% of, relative 12% of the revenue. When, when you look at that, it shows the, the concentration that existed on the, uh, what the oil and gas, the severance tax economy. You know, and it, it's a, uh, Professor Young said this as well, and I agree with him. One of the reasons we did not happen to have, we didn't require a consumption tax is we effectively had one. We had actually a, a smarter tax system than either Wyoming or Dakotas because we didn't focus on a single resource, which is why they're upside down now. We had two legs and a severance tax or a natural resource tax-based system. But our problem is, is our natural resource-based system, the economy is evolving in Montana. A couple other thoughts I would add. One is, there's always this argument you can simply increase the income tax. Um, I'll, I'll be honest, I think the Laffer curve is oversold at the federal level. That's a supply side economic curve. I believe we're actually back past the peak. It doesn't work the way people think. But I don't think it's oversold at the state level. And, and what I mean by that is the 6.9% income tax, our border is permeable. It's pretty hard to move an oil well. It's pretty hard to move a mine. It's pretty hard to move a forest. Damn easy to move a financial system or a tech company. You know, why do you think that the majority of the folks that have residence in, in the Yellowstone Club don't declare them as primary residences? Because why would you want to pay 6.9% income tax? And so if you think the solution of this is to simply raise the income tax, then you've got to explain to me why the recent work is showing that every state that does that, they have a problem with companies crossing their borders and leaving. Borders are permanent. There's a Wealth of States book. I actually believe that's fairly real here. Uh, and interestingly enough, in 2003, we did that tax cut from 11 to 6.9%. And uh, this is an interesting chart. Fiscal Division put it together for me. I was curious what happened. And if you notice, even then, the number of millionaires that were willing to pay taxes in Montana increased on the drop from 11 to 6.9. You know, and, and so while the collection from the 200,000 or below folks dropped, the higher payers increased. Those people that have the wherewithal to make that kind of money are capable of locating themselves somewhere to keep it. 6.9% is not a high rate, but it is if it's applied to a lot of dollars. It, it, yeah. And that appears to be accelerating now as the economy has shifted underneath. So I think I'm at the end. I tried to hurry here. Uh, Walmart versus Yellow Cap, we talked about all of this. You know, how high tech and high finance, some of our largest can headquarter anywhere. Uh, what we can measure, what we don't, you know, because I don't want to steal. Uh, so here's my bottom line. I predict that the data will show that the Montana 6 tax system will need some updating for equity. You know, and, and if we don't do this, we'll continue to overbear the, the traditional. And I think you'll see it in the residential. It seems to be moving that way. Uh, when politicians tell you they're going to slash government spending in a balanced budget state, 
give them a few points of, of efficiency gain and say, okay, you're cutting government spending 15%, I'll give you 5% efficiency, show me the 10% you're going to eliminate on the ground, in the local area, because that's where the money goes. Make them define the services. You know, uh, I, I think we could actually create a revenue neutral tax change now if we were willing to work on it. Find some way to buy down some property tax, maybe buy down the income tax a point or two, replace it. I don't know what else it would be, but some form of consumption tax. It, it needs to be part of the conversation. Is it politically saleable? I don't know. You know, I, usually government doesn't act until there's a crisis. Usually you've got to wait till you're flat broke and, and on your back before you can get government to do anything. I find that disappointing, but it's probably more of a reality than not. So is this, is, are these studies valuable? Absolutely. We don't have the data, especially the local data. I, I look forward to understanding what the cities are spending on. Because I, I was a city owner. I don't think they're spending on bad things, but I want to know exactly what the services they are. I want to know where the county's money is going. You know, do the, is there a bad actor here and there? Of course there is. But overall, think about it. These are people you elect. They are trying to provide for you the services you ask for. You know, I know this last song, so I, I, I appreciated having the trucks plot. But with that, I better quit talking and Jim. <laughs> You guys are not going to have nearly the same fun with me that you had with Lou. However, I do have something that's better, and that is because you are going to drink right after me, mine is short. <laughs> the other thing that I think is important is we have, did Patrick go away? No, he sat down. Economists, economists, somewhere else there's more economists, economists graduate. Well, I was a financial advisor. We had to take all of their theories and postulations and try to make practical money with them. And the one thing that we learned is economists are really good at predicting recessions. In fact, they've predicted nine of the last five. <laughs> <laughs> so I just had to fight back a little bit there uh, for those of us who are not economists. Thank you, Montana Taxpayers Association, for the opportunity to speak and the chance to be here. This is, this is fun for me, and uh, hopefully there'll be a little bit of fun in it for you as well. Um, I do want to start by saying, you know, our study, HP 715, uh, was sponsored, uh, and he didn't mention this, but it was sponsored by Lou, um, and he was really the architect of what we're going to be doing in this process. And because of that, I think that he deserves some respect and some attention for how he thinks this study should go. Today, though, I want to talk to you about my view of how I think the study should go, and a lot of it's going to be reinforcing what he said. Uh, but also there will be some differences. However, before I go there, I'd like to spend a few minutes on a topic I hear a lot about, Lou touched just a little bit on it, uh, when we talk about tax studies, and uh, that is the, the answer to, well, no, we don't have to talk about spending because we're just gonna grow our way out of having less revenue. Growth is one thing, and secondly, if we're not careful about our tax system, as Lou was saying, uh, the belief is that folks are going to migrate out of our state, we'll have even less revenue. And people won't migrate into our state if we don't change our tax system. Well, let me, uh, let me look at uh, something here real quickly for you. Uh, I think the argument can best be characterized as that the data supports that we should rely more on a particular tax in a revenue neutral system, a closed system, as being clear and definitive that that's the winning argument. And what do I mean by that more specifically? Well, some legislatures, a lot of legislatures, have been taking a look at uh, the income tax and perhaps we should slice the income tax down and uh, change the pattern of folks migrating and, and the growth in the states. So let's see if I can make this move on. So, let's pick on California a little bit. Not because I want to model after them, but because I like picking on them. I moved here in 1976, and we all hate Californians. <laughs> Sorry for those of you who are from California, I apologize. But this came out of the LA Times, the Capital Journal section. High Texas be damned, the rich keep moving to California. Are the rich fleeing California to escape the high taxes? This is a very high tax state, as you all know. 
Nope, turns out that's not true. In fact, more wealthy people are moving into California than leaving, the research indicates. It's the poor and the middle class who are departing. What about the growth issue? Surely the taxes with no income, or the states with no income tax must be growing faster. That's the theory. Four lines here, sorry you can't read it. I'm even having a hard time reading it. It's Texas, Florida, Nevada, and California. California is the top line. Texas is the next line. And I can't see up there who's who. Florida, I think, is the red one. The olive color is, uh, is the last one I mentioned. This is growth from 2012 to 2018, I think it is, uh, Federal Reserve information. Interestingly enough, the tax, high tax state is growing faster than the no income tax states. So, mentioned on that previous slide, oops, that one, <laughs> this is really a great slide. You know, the great thing about being a legislator is you have no staff. And if you don't know anything about technology, you can come out with slides like this. <laughs> and, uh, and I confess I'm no good at it, so this is a Berkeley slide. Uh, because you can't read what the caption says, even though there is a caption. But I'll make it easy for you. The top line is all states. The, the left side are all the individual states, you can't read them. The top uh, bar across is the levels of income. All states, migration in or out. The orange color, darker whatever color that is, the orange or rust or whatever it is, is out migration that has occurred from California to other states. Dark color is, dark blue colors, is the in migration into California from other states. What this graph is showing you is people are leaving California in the low and middle income brackets. High income bracket folks are moving into California. Apparently the young and the wealthy still like California. Now there was a study by these two guys, who uh, Rao and Shuai, who, I can't pronounce his name. Um, <clears throat> Hoover Institution out of Stanford, I think it is. Um, went through a whole thing kind of confirming the theory that in fact if you reduce taxes or if you don't reduce taxes the wealthy are going to leave and if you do they'll come in. And at the end of their report they said, you know, this sort of behavioral response to taxation is an active topic of inquiry of among, among economists and indeed an open question. Not a closed question, not a, com not a final conclusion. There's still debate over this. Their colleagues, uh, Barner and Young, no relation Doug, I don't think, uh, wrote a recent paper. It's clear there is not a pattern of millionaire out migration in the recent years, despite a four percentage point increase in their taxes in California. <clears throat> so, by the way, I want to come back to this for just a second. Uh, the top bar is all states, but if you went down and looked through the states, uh, what you would find is it appears to be the case in the other states that there's the migration, the most common migration is, uh, when you look on a more granular level, is the same in other states. It's lower and middle income people that are moving, not high income people. So now why do you think those folks are moving? Why is it the low and middle income folks that are moving? Well, Census population survey says 48% gave the reason of housing costs. 30% family. 20% employment. 2% other. About 2.5% of the population migrates from state to state. Most of the moves in the country are in state. County to county, not state to state. Two and a half percent migrate out. So let's claim that all that two percent who said other reason for moving are all tax related. We have two percent of two and a half percent who might be attributable to taxes. 
doesn't sound like a very good tool to base policy on. Think about this for just a second. If you're a middle and low income person and you're moving, you're going to save a lot of money on taxes? Probably not. You're going to save it on housing. In fact, housing is about two and a half times what you might save on taxes by moving from Los Angeles to another part of the country. So, I guess what I would say on this piece of this is that the SALT limitations <coughs> passed in the 2017 Tax Act, they might change this data. We might see something different. There's a lot of articles out there right now. It's kind of fun to, to dig into this. A lot of articles out there right now about how migration has completely changed in the last year and a half. Maybe, maybe not. Pretty hard to tell in that short of a time period. It's not what the longer term data says. So, if we shouldn't change our tax system to retain or attract people because of taxes, what should we be looking at? Well, I would propose to you that we should look at how we invest our taxes so that we keep the people that we have here so amenities, schools, housing costs, or do we attract people? People don't move to Bozeman for housing costs. There's something else they move for. <laughs> There's some other amenities. What are we investing in? This one I, I just thought was interesting as I uh, was digging into things that doesn't particularly apply in this spot, but I'll just go through it real quickly anyway. Um, this is, um, some work done by uh, U.S. Election Services, I think it is, uh, maybe the census. The anticipated uh, gains and losses in 2020 in apportionment, in other words, in the House of Representatives, federally. So I looked at this and thought, well, no, maybe I'm wrong. Texas is picking up a lot, no income tax. Florida's picking up a lot, no income tax. Oh, wait a second. North Carolina's picking up the seat tax. Arizona's tax. Colorado's tax. Oregon's tax. These are income taxes. Montana's tax. What's common on the right-hand side from my point of view? Probably not statistically significant study on my part, but one warm weather state on that side of the page. <laughs> Alabama. All the rest are cold weather states. Could there be other reasons for moving besides taxes? You betcha. So what else should we look at? I would say when we're studying taxes, we should also look at the volat from our revenue points of view now, not whether people are going to move here or not. It's the volatility issue, and Dr. Young talked about that. Rep. Jones talked about that. I would just add this little piece. You know, I think if we look at three major things, income tax, corporate tax, and property tax, there is what I would call a level of volatility, but also a level, a level of impact. So income tax, People have said it's fairly volatile, but relative to other, some of our other taxes, natural resources, corporate, it's actually a pretty stable tax. It has a very high impact because it's a very big number in our budget. Corporate taxes, very volatile, high volatility, and maybe not quite so much impact because it's a low number in our tax system. Property tax, very stable, and probably also very low impact in things uh, because as uh, Rep. Jones said so much of it goes back to the local. So volatility, I think, can <coughs> uh, generally be viewed as how dependable are our resources or revenues, and what are the risk and demands on those resources. That's what I think 715 is supposed to be looking at. How do we make it more stable and dependable on the revenue side, and how do we mitigate the risks on the spending side? So, um, let me switch gears slightly here. I'm kind of in a unique position. Uh, I think the reason maybe I was asked to talk is because I'm on both studies. I'm on HJ35 as well as uh, this study, MARA, which is, uh, stands for Modernization and Risk Analysis. And as part of the, my service on the MARA side, I'm on the subcommittee that's looking at three things. Um, well, I'll call it two things, pensions, and local and state government interaction. So places that uh, 
uh, state government sends money local, local sends money back, and so forth. <clears throat> okay, so I'm really switching gears here right now to the, um, the pension side. So I'm coming down to my subcommittee. The um, first thing I want to say about this study, by the way, I've got some pretty strong feelings. I think that everything that we do in state and local government should be out on the table and we should look at it all. There is no reason why we should have anything that's considered a Pandora's box that we don't want to open it. Uh, if we are going to make good decisions, we need good data. And LFD is doing a good job, I think, of that, uh, gathering us some good data. But it's also important in this process as we gather data that we don't get too biased. In fact, we shouldn't be biased at all. We should be agnostic about this stuff. We're just looking at data. We're going to have plenty of time to lobby and make political decisions. But at the moment, what we need to do is understand the data, identify the risk, and then when we decide we want to keep the service, as Rep. Jones was talking about a number of times, then we find solutions. It's not getting the data, and it's not identifying the risk that are the political issues. It's the solutions part. We just need to be clear about what we're doing there. So part of what uh, we've been trying to do in our committee is uh, look at the pension uh, side of things. The reason we're looking at pensions is it's a, it can be a very volatile area, and it can also have a lot of surprises in it, unlike some other areas. But let's talk first about what should happen uh, before we delve into what's a reasonable estimate of what might happen. So uh, this is just a look in our pensions. This is PERS. In our pension, uh, we have an assumed interest rate of 7.65%. If we get that return, uh, that's that orange line running through there. And 30 years from now, our pensions will be fully 100% funded. That's extraordinarily unusual. I think only one state has that at this point, by the way. The blue is, what's the range of reasonable expectations for return in those years? Well, a lot of range, isn't there? And, and our, our expectation here is 7.65 each and every year. But that's what should happen if things go according to oil. Now, part of the reason that this is important in our, our little subcommittee on uh, state and local government is the fact that 52% of pension contributions, uh, excuse me, 52% of those receiving pension contributions, this is not counting the money that's coming from our general fund, our state level employees, 48% are state, our local, uh, local, county, city, local government folks. Mm -hmm. It's a problem for both sides. I shouldn't say a problem. It's something to be studied for both sides. Okay, what happens if we don't get 7.65% year after year after year? Well, same kind of chart. Uh, this is a return, uh, I don't think we have it up there on the graph, but it's roughly 6%. More conservative return. Uh, you can see the orange line goes the wrong direction. We're becoming less and less funded. The range of, of possibilities exists. So that begins to identify what risk do we have in our budget for this item. So let me be clear before I get any further in this, is often when we talk about pensions, they're referred to in a negative way. We're on the hook. We owe money. Well, but the fact is we made a business decision many, 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 many years ago. And the business decision was you come to work for us, state, local, school districts, whatever. This is part of the package. I think that's a contract. We need to honor that financial obligation. And that's part of what we're thinking in here is how do we honor that? What are the risks to honoring that? How do we go about honoring it? Um, next thing I would say is you need to know that uh, this slide is not a reflection on our Board of Investments. In fact, our Board of Investments is doing a very fine job. I'm the liaison to the Board of Investments from the legislature, for the Democrats anyway. And um, their returns are above average for these kind of plans. So they're doing a fine job. I don't think we need to be concerned about that. 
And lastly, I would say in terms of our state pensions, um, they are not in any kind of catastrophic situation. Do we have a problem? Small problem? We might. That's why we're studying it. But they're certainly not in any catastrophic situation at this point. So I don't want anybody who has a pension running out of here and having twice as many drinks. <laughs> All right, so there's a couple of other interesting slides. Probably I'm more interested in this than you are, but our 7.65% average return, they're not equal. Depends on how they come. If you get an average return of 7.65, that could include getting 7.65 every year. But you could get weak returns early, or you could get strong returns early, or you could have a mixed bag of them. That's what these different lines are. The, uh, as you might guess, the orange line is, uh, is even equal returns along the way. Uh, the yellow line, which is the lowest one, is uh, weak early returns. That's always bad. If you're retiring, you don't want to get the worst returns on your retirement when you first retire. Uh, blue return, uh, blue line is a, just a random mixture. Gray line is getting your strong returns early. It matters. These things matter a lot. So what happens if this pension or teacher's retirement underperforms? What does that mean for us? <clears throat> Pardon me, I've messed up my notes here enough. So, uh, kind of hard to see here, but uh, this is a, uh, the numbers up at the top, assumed return, the discount rate, I won't get into that at this point. The actual return in this case is 6% over the next 30 years, we'd have to add one and a quarter billion dollars in employee <coughs> contributions. That is over 30 years, but you know, when you get over a billion dollars, you're talking about real money. <clears throat> what happens if the actual rate is only 1% below the assumed return, and this is in the actuarial study, it's a different slide than this one. It's in the actuarial study, 1% difference means in fiscal year 2020, we'd have to add $100 million. 1%. Okay, um, I think the last slide I've got on the pension book, I maybe left that one out there. I didn't put this other one in, so I'm going to leave that hanging up there for the moment. Um, we have one other slide, which is, uh, oops, back too far. Ooh. Uh, there is one other slide I have that is, uh, what happens if we have a recession similar to the 0204 time period? But then we return to 7.65% for the next 30 years. Not predicting that'll happen. If it is, it's a billion dollars. So what return the plan gets is going to be uncertain. But we know where you start is very important. And where we're starting today is we're starting at a market that is in the top, des top, ten top tenth, top decile of valuations in the market in history. Interest rates, pretty darn close to the lowest interest rates we've ever had in history. What does that mean for returns? I guess historically it would imply we're going to have lower returns in the plan. That creates a risk. That's what we're trying to identify in 715 in this area. Um, I think it was uh, um, Dr. Barkey said, this time it's different. Once again, a difference between economists and financial advisors. It's the worst possible word you could ever hear from a financial advisor. Oh, it's different this time. <laughs> but we do have some circumstances that seem awful different this time. All right, so let me switch gears then away from the pension. This happens to be my favorite. That's why I spent the most time on it. Um, not, uh, it has also uh, potential to be a little bit more volatile. Uh, then maybe some of these others I'm going to mention. But um, some of the others that we're considering and getting data on is uh, the Office of Public Defender. Uh, the needs are growing there. 
Criminal justice reform has been a big important deal in the legislature in the last two sessions. Um, so we need to figure out why are those expenses growing? And is it state laws, is it local laws? What's causing that? Um, what's the cost per year? Uh, these are certainly not, a, this is not as big an issue as a pension, pensions could be, uh, but it is important to both the state and local levels. Um, entitlement share. We're trying to gather the data and figure out is the amount of uh, revenue that the state took in comparable to the amount of expenses that the state is participating in with the local level? We don't know that for sure yet. Um, what is the actual case? We're getting good cooperation with uh, uh, MACO and the League of Towns and Cities to pull that money or that data together. So that's something we'll be looking at. Remember, it's important in this data not to be evaluating it as we're getting it, but to be agnostic. Get it, figure out if this is a service or a structure we want to keep, and then figure out what the solutions are to that. Another thing we're looking at, um, 1510-420, which is the thing that Rep. Jones was talking about that limits the growth of property taxes to half the rate of inflation over the last three years. Um, I think there was some sense that new property was going to make up for that cap at some point. Does it? We're not sure. <laughs> Maybe the phone knows. <laughs> what have local governments done as an alternative to that? Voted levies are, are more prominent. Fees are more prominent. Um, let's get a figure for what those are. That will help us. What does that growth look like in that kind of, in, in that arena? What kind of growth in their spending is going on? How about infrastructure spending? Infrastructure spending, not just at the state level, but infrastructure spending at the local level is gigantic. State is participating in that. How are we participating? How much money is going that direction? Just the TSEP program alone looks to me like it's $30 million for water and wastewater projects. I don't know, I mean, there's six other programs. I don't know all of them well enough to give you the numbers there. These are, these are things that maybe have a risk unlike a pension risk. We're not gonna get surprised that we need a new wastewater system somewhere. But these are, are services that are gonna compete for money if we get in a tight budget and we need to know what are the risks and how do we mitigate those risks ahead of time. Um, TIF districts might be another one to look at. It's a smaller issue, but it does affect our school funding. What, how much? What's the impact? It's kind of unclear at this time, but that's really what the mission of 715 is, is to get answers to questions like this. Uh, it's the mission we're on. So I look forward to uh, sort of melding the findings of the two studies. Hopefully we can work together near the end and bring together the information we've gotten from me and give it to each other. And uh, now I look forward to your questions and having a drink with you. Thank you. Thank you both for very stimulating presentations. We'll take a couple of questions. We're running like up against the end of the day here. Does anyone have a question they'd like to ask? We can catch him over at the social hour. We'll kind of hurt him You should have next door uh, or there's a drink. You should have some tickets in the back of your badge for, for a drink if you want them. I want to thank again all our presenters today. I think we have a pretty good program. Hope you did too. Let's, let's give them all a round. I also want to thank Pam standing in the door there for doing all your presentation. have a couple gifts for the presenters here. Thank you all for coming. We'll see you next time.